the river of change churns slowly in Philadelphia. Traditions die hard in this historic city where its time-honored architecture changes little with the passing years. But for the tradition of winning football to carry on in this town, change is not only inevitable, it is essential. In 1983, for the first time in seven years, the Philadelphia Eagles had a new head coach, longtime defensive coordinator Marion Campbell. Campbell's first year at the helm was marked by the sudden transition to a youthful roster that included 19 first or second year players. It was highlighted at times by the return of a recent Philadelphia trademark, the swarming Eagles defense. But 1983 was also a long and trying season in Philadelphia where anxious and eager eagle hands were unable to attain the lofty goals they were reaching for. It was a difficult time of decision for Marion Campbell, a year that saw many new faces and constantly changing places in both starting lineups. A year symbolized by the retirement of a long-time standout for the birds, offensive tackle Stan Walters. But the time for the old guard to depart is also a sure sign that there are new players on the horizon. In this season of change in Philadelphia, there was not only a football, but a torch passed on to a new generation of Eagles. It was under the hot summer sun of Camp Swamp Fox where the Eagles began to tread their comeback road. A path paved with a back-to-basics brand of fundamental football. More important than pushing him, take this spot, Kenny. More important than pushing him is getting up here at the top of the at the top of the route, starting in here, plant and come back out. Step, hit, then take your third step like so. Just maintain that for me, will you? Gotta explode. Good job, Spag. Good job. The enthusiasm of assistant coaches such as newcomers Billy Matthews and Frank Gans and veteran Fred Bruni spread through the Eagles' camp. There was an air of optimism filtering through the August heat. It sent the Eagles sailing through three preseason victories. And in September, it carried them to San Francisco's Candlestick Park where the 49ers' plans for a happy home opener were ambushed. Montana to Wendell Tyler, leaping for the first down, fumbles the football recovered by the Eagles. With backup quarterback Joe Pisarczyk replacing injured Ron Jaworski, Philadelphia stunned the eventual NFC West champions with a come-from-behind victory. Eagles' hopes in their home opener rested with the challenge of scalping the world champion Redskins. In one of Philadelphia's most physical contests, Washington prevailed, despite being held to its lowest point total of the season. It was back out to the west, where once again the sun seemed to shine brightest for Philadelphia. Ron Jaworski teamed up with second-year receivers Mel Hoover, number 85, and Mike Quick, number 82, as the Eagles flew past the Broncos for their second victory in three games. Although the offense rolled up a season-high 407 yards in Denver, defense was the dominating factor in the Eagles' early success. The secondary with Bax Herman Edwards, number 46, along with Brenard Wilson, Randy Logan, Dennis Devon, and Roynell Young, number 43, 
shut down prolific passing attacks in San Francisco and Atlanta. The containment of outside linebackers Reggie Wilkes, number 51, and newcomer Joel Williams, number 59, helped clog the avenues of their opponent's rushing attack. Special teams MVP Bill Cower, number 57, and rookie Jody Schultz, number 53, were aggressive newcomers to this already solid unit. 1983 was also a year of experimentation, and one formula that was instantly successful was the insertion of second-year linebacker Anthony Griggs, number 58, to a starting inside position. Briggs was an opportunistic Johnny on the spot for Philadelphia, leading all Eagle linebackers with three interceptions. Led by the fleet feet of Anthony Griggs and his counterpart on the inside, number 56 Jerry Robinson, Eagles linebackers were among the fastest in the NFL. Steady Robinson was selected the Eagles' most valuable defensive player. And for the second year in a row, he was the team leader in tackles. Robinson's relentless pursuit not only scared off opposing quarterbacks, but supported the pass rush of number 68, defensive end Dennis Harrison, the Eagles' six foot, eight inch giant killer. Harrison's consecutive sacks of Phil Sims were two of his career high total of 11 and a half. Along with nose tackle Ken Clark, they bruised and battered the birds of St. Louis in a hard fought defeat. And sacked and shackled the Falcons of Atlanta in a thrilling comeback victory. At the Meadowlands, in the season's sixth week, the Giants were limited to a single touchdown. And with the now deadly accurate Jaworski to quick combination striking again for two scores, the Eagles swamped New York for their second victory in a row. The somewhat surprising four and two record had the Eagles flying high. And for one man who had labored long and hard to bring it about, it was a timely moment to savor sweetly with a smile. In the NFL, success is rarely achieved when a change at the top is not met with a change in the ranks. For Philadelphia, days of reckoning with that painful reality were awaiting. In Dallas, the soaring eagles came crashing down to earth. They would stay there for the next six weeks, forcing the pat hands of Marion Campbell into some very serious shuffling of the decks. Well, I'm fortunate for us, we have stayed the same since our Super Bowl uh, year, 1980. Our starting uh, offense and defense, basically the same, not many changes. We, we had a losing season last year, and putting two and two together, I felt like that two and a half year period is a long time to evaluate people. I wanted to make some changes, and I think when you've had that long of a stretch where you are not really getting over the hump and you're not a really a, a playoff team anymore, I felt like we had to make some changes. Hard decisions had to be made, and in some key positions it became a case of out with the old and in with the new. On defense, young players like number 96 Harvey Armstrong and number 98 Greg Brown were given the chance to contribute regularly and show off their specialty of applying the pressure. It was Brown, a third-year free agent, who blossomed as his playing time increased. It was his wildly pursuing style of sack and strip that solidified a starting position at defensive end. The need to produce more turnovers and bone-jarring tackles was high among Marion Campbell's priorities. One man who fit the bill was rookie Wes Hopkins, number 48, who was inserted into the starting secondary 
and immediately crashed the Eagles' hit parade. Hopkins' combativeness and penchant for forcing fumbles were matched by the big play recklessness of number 24, Ray Ellis, a late season secondary starter who proved to be a scourge of superstar running backs around the league. Swarming the opposition. It was a successful style of play carried on fearlessly by number 52 Rich Cranach and special teamers Bill Cower, Perry Harrington, Byron Darby, Albert Fowles, and Thomas Struthers. This unit ranked among the league's best, thanks in part to a return to form of punter Max Runniger and the play of a wild-eyed rookie named Major Everett, number 39. While a simple facelift sufficiently fueled the defense and special teams, massive surgery on offense, particularly to a backfield and line ravaged by injury, was just what the doctor ordered. Third-year defensive tackle Leonard Mitchell was transplanted to the offense, while second-year tackle Dean Miraldi was told it was time for him to stand up and deliver. Miraldi and Mitchell joined steady linemen Jerry Sizemore, Ron Baker, Jim Fritchie, Jerry Theory, and number 73 Steve Kenny to provide escort service for talented rookies like Michael Williams, number 32. Once he got over his anxiety of handling a starting job at halfback, Williams responded with a rush of running fireworks. Eagle coaches are anticipating a potentially explosive backfield in 1984, particularly with the expected return of number 31, Wilbert Montgomery, who showed signs of his old self in the late season after being sidelined with a knee injury. Williams and Montgomery will be joined in the backfield by fullback Hubie Oliver, who burst into a starting role in 1983 as the team's top rusher and second leading receiver. Michael Haddix, the Eagles' 1983 number one draft pick, displayed his versatility by playing several positions. But he will concentrate at performing at fullback in 1984. Although youth abounded in the Eagles' attack, the leadership and stability of Ron Jaworski stood steadfast and firm amidst these winds of change. In 1983, Jaws passed for 20 touchdowns and eclipsed the 20,000-yard milestone while passing for 3,315 yards, the second-highest season total of his 10-year career. But statistics tell only part of the story. Curry tells the rest. Time and time again, Ron Jaworski stared down the face of enemy blitzes, but still delivered the ball into the hands of his youthful receivers. With starting tight end John Spagnola on injured reserve in 1983, Ron Jaworski was able to tap the resources of capable backups such as Lawrence Sampleton and number 84, Vito Cap. Along with second-year receivers Mel Hoover, number 83 Tony Woodruff, and rookie Glenn Young, number 89, they form a potentially dangerous core of pass catchers. Youth was served in large portions for Philadelphia in 1983. Yet there was also a veteran presence that served to motivate Harold Carmichael, the leading receiver in Eagle history. The spotlight that Harold Carmichael once basked in shifted its sights in 1983, and it passed from the man who is tied for fifth among the NFL's all-time leading receivers to a man who made an all-out assault on Eagles record books in his first season as a starter. Few players in Philadelphia football history have earned a Pro Bowl invitation as spectacularly as Mike Quick. 
In the early stages of the season, number 82 was a familiar sight far behind enemy lines. But when this former number one draft pick began to draw double coverage and attention, defenses discovered they were dealing with a combination of RC, OJ, and ET, all wrapped into one. In addition to tying a club mark of 13 touchdowns and setting club records with 69 receptions and six 100-yard days, Mike Quick also amassed 1,409 yards, the highest single season total in the NFL since 1967. In a season of change, when so many Eagles were given a chance to earn their wings, Mike Quick, who caught only 10 passes in 1982, flew far above the clouds as a supreme source of inspiration for 1983 and for many seasons to come. Through the changes wrought towards the end of 1983, the Eagles began to catch a glimmer of light to what the future holds for them in 1984. The first positive steps of the direction the Eagles were heading in came to the fore in Washington's RFK Stadium. Against the NFC champion Redskins, the Eagle offense exploded for three second quarter touchdowns as Ron Jaworski passed for a season-high 333 yards. The defense refused to cave in to Washington's record-breaking attack. In the second half, they shut out the skins, while safety Ray Ellis snapped Joe Theismann's streak of 103 unintercepted passes. Against the Redskins, some young Eagles were earning respect. Against Eric Dickerson and the Los Angeles Rams, they learned what it takes to play winning football. Eagles could use a turnover here. The handoff to Dickerson, hit at the five, carrying people to the three. The football is loose, and the Eagles have it. The pitch goes out to Dickerson, who looks, breaks away from one man, but the Eagles swarm him again. A fumbled football, recovered by the Eagles. Eagles ball. There was 10 out of 11 Eagle defensive players around that guy when that whistle was uh, being blown. That's going back to the old swarming defensive team the Eagles had at one time. It has been 24 years since the Eagles beat the Los Angeles Rams. 28 seconds remaining for football on the 29-yard line. Three wide receivers again. Slot to the near side. Jaworski looking over the defense. Jaworski back, looking, going deep down the far side of the field. The ball is caught. Touchdown, Eagles. Touchdown, Tony Woodruff. A 29-yard scoring toss from Jaworski to Tony Woodruff. And the Eagles are 21 seconds away from a thrilling win. The Eagles marched proudly into the vet to meet the Saints a week later. But despite a hearty welcome by some of the league's most loyal fans, the home team fell far behind well into the fourth quarter. Help was on hand, though. With the aid of one of the Eagles' most fervent followers, the Philadelphia faithful stirred from their seats and they looked forward to an early Christmas present coming in the form of a rousing comeback in the year's final home game. Eagles trying to get back in this football game. 
Saints are coming as Jaworski fires the quick. Spins away from man of the 10 and the 5. Quick for the touchdown. Now quick goes in motion. Jaworski rolling to the near side. Pumps, fires, touchdown Carmichael. The Eagles illuminated the scoreboard with their gallant effort. But their light was extinguished in the deep, cold December darkness by a 50-yard overtime field goal. While some heads were hung low, others looked up and saw progress in these signs of growth and maturity. The comeback showed a lot of character. They could have uh, folded. They didn't do it. They didn't do it at any time during the season. We've got character here, and I think what we are doing, we're not disturbing the nucleus of our football team with the moves we're making. We're only trying to build and add to the nucleus that we have, and that's what it did during the season, and I think that was reflected in the Saint game. The Eagles have expanded upon this nucleus in the offseason by acquiring a proven talent from the Miami Dolphins in Mark Denner, who in 1984 will center the wide-open attack of new assistant coach Ted Marchibroda, one of the NFL's most successful offensive coordinators. I'm impressed with this ball club from this standpoint that we have people who have been to the Super Bowl. I think they know what it takes in order to, to have that type, that type of success. So I'm optimistic from that standpoint. This is a talented football team in many areas. There are some areas that need to be filled in, but I think uh, basically when you look at a Montgomery and a Spagnola and a Mike Quick, I think the football team can win. The worst of the shotgun takes the low snap. He retreats. He is going over the middle. Completes a quick 25, 20, 15, 10. Quick racing touchdown. The Eagles are traveling a long and hard road back to a winning and exciting level of play. And they plan to do it the old-fashioned way by earning